Thank you so much. Um, and what a pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, bad to have a session after lunch, but I think Shikhar did a pretty good job in uh, waking us up, uh, seeing how amazing each of us are. So without further ado, let me get into the session. I have an esteemed group of panelists here. Uh, would, be lo would love to hear from them, their views on how we as an industry, we as HR professionals are moving towards a skill-first organization and how technology, data, analytics, all that we've been speaking about is helping us take there. So Dr. CJ Kumar, maybe you know, just start with you to set the stage and just understand what really a scale-first organization means. So what's, what's the vision? What do we understand as, as HR professionals by scale-first organizations? Good afternoon. Thank you. ETHR World and uh, Respirit for this opportunity. Um, last two and a half years has been a very horrifying experience for all of us. And uh, in fact, in the last two, three months, I'm very happy to be part of some of the live conferences like this, which gives a totally a different uh, feeling. Two things have happened, as uh, the World Economic Forum keeps talking about, is the double disruption. One is the pandemic at one side, and the other side is technology changes which has come out. If you, if most of you would have gone through the World Economic Forum report, which talks about there will be 85 million jobs will go away, and 92 million new jobs will emerge, which requires a total different set of skill sets which are uh, required. Same manner, there are other many studies, even the uh, study by McKinsey has also said that 85% of the executives have said that there is a shortage of skill gap. Let me take our own example of last night you drove. Uh, we went into a digital transformation four, five years back, uh, luckily before the pandemic. So we did a whole lot of digitalization, right from, uh, even though it is an EPC industry, automation of most of our processes, including things like AR, VR, 3D printing, uh, using of uh, uh, business intelligence modeling, we call it as building intelligence modeling, BIM, uh, we went into, uh, used drones for survey, all those things. But all these things require a new type of skill sets. Plus, we have also entered into many new businesses like uh, uh, SOFIN, that is supply chain and finance, which is an Amazon for engineering goods. We went into EduTech, which is education um, assessment and education. All these things, I required a totally new type of skill sets. When I have to recruit, I cannot go into my traditional 80-year-old company system of BE pass out of 93 batch, 94 batch, and this is the basic, this is the DA I'll give. Totally, you cannot get anybody. It is purely based on the skill. So, whether I do recruitment, whether I fix a compensation, whether I train the people, the whole focus is on a particular skill. So, the whole training methodology has changed, whole recruitment methodology has changed, Compensation fixation has changed, internal hierarchy systems have changed. So, yes, added to this, you would have also seen the report from the, the uh, industry where the academia, which is 45% of the graduate engineers who are passing out are not employable. This adds up to the problem. It is not in line with the industry. So quickly, uh, if you have to act fast, get the people, to look, clearly identify what type of skill sets are required, put them through a structured training process and make them employable at the earliest. So that is the challenge for each one of the HR people here. With this, I leave this stage to speak and we'll take it further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. This was, this was very helpful and set the stage for our conversation further on how it, there's a need to put in skills in everything we do. Recruitment, org hierarchies, compensation, that's, that's the that's the core of a skill-first organization. So now if I may, maybe uh, Mr. Srinivasan uh, go over to you. Uh, um, I think Dr. Jayakumar touched upon it. 
there's a big shift that the pandemic and the digitization has brought, uh, has brought in and how we think about scale first organization. So what do you, you know, what are the, to your uh, mind, top three things that have really changed because of this whole digitization, innovation, pandemic, you know, how has it changed in how we think about skills? So uh, <clears throat> I think uh, from a skill standpoint, I think there are three broad um, changes that I see happening in uh, as far as skill first organizations are concerned. One is, um, you know, uh, in the post pandemic era, I think the uptake of digital, um, you know, AI, machine learning, this has, you know, uh, this is no longer, a, you know, a, a nice to have kind of a skill set, right? And it has become a very important skill set because we are now talking about, uh, you know, metaverse, we are talking about, uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, hologram presence, so on and so forth. So I think with, with the pandemic came uh, the need for, uh, certain skill sets such as, uh, you know, if I were to, you know, list them down, there will be a whole lot of them, but I think pretty much digital uh, and cloud computing uh, were very important skill sets, right, that came into four. They, are, they were existent earlier, but they became as important as any other enterprise or core stack skills, right, so that's point number one. Point number two was even companies operating on legacy technologies had to, you know, move into, you know, an innovation mode. And because uh, people who were still operating on uh, legacy technologies had a certain change management to go through before uh, you know, they got into an innovative mode, they used the services of innovative technology companies for you know, changing their entire technology landscape. So there was investment in that. And the third is the complexity of skills as well as the ease of skills. Both have risen uh, you know, uh, at par because uh, when I say complexity of skills, you have now quantum computing, right? Um, as controversial as it may be, blockchain, right? These are, uh, you know, technologies which are definitely uh, complicated, require complex mathematical coding. But at the same time, you have democratization of technology with things like Python, which is, which is now something that 13 to 17 year olds are using, right? So I think uh, there, is, there has been a growth of both ends of the spectrum, right? And to which end the service has been, uh, you know, basically dependent on what the individual or what the corporation wants, based on whether it's a it's a digital technology or it's an open system. So that that really is, you know, a, a, a very exciting change that I see, uh, you know, uh, in the in the market today. Great, great perspective, sir. So, um, Rashmi, if my, I may ask you, you lead HR transformation for such a big organization, right, for Biocon. So some of the things that uh, Sr. Srinivas touched upon, there are a lot of challenges, right? It's, it's just change, you know, skills have changed, you know, how we look at skills have changed. We don't know even, is it the same, you know, B-school or technical schools, the same, what the conversation we were having outside, right? We don't know how to look at these new skills anymore. So as, as the HR transformation lead, how are you dealing with it? What are the challenges you are seeing in your organization dealing with, you know, taking your people in the skill journey? So I think um, like our organization, I'm sure many organizations are facing this challenge wherein we have primarily, we focus on primary skills, you know, functional skills, technical skills. And we do not focus as much on adjacent skills. For example, you know, engineers and scientists, while PhDs and um, MTech, doctorate, et cetera, is required in R&D, but um, to have critical thinking, decision, prob decision making, problem solving, these are also skills that are required by engineers and scientists, which are not given as much importance as our functional and technical skills are given, right? So that is one area where we have to kind of, um, you know, not really push back, but we have to bring awareness to our businesses, to our function heads that, and that's the transition, you know, that uh, he was talking about from a role to a skill, right? So that's where the transition is. Second and the key factor is shift in mindset, right? And it is not really owned by HR, so to say, it has to be co-owned by the business, co-owned by the functions because you require specific domain skills, right? Each function would have a very specific skill sets. So this has to be owned. There is a shift in the mindset that is required as an organization. So like somebody was talking about the Holy Grail right now, right? 
So an R&D person might not be comfortable working for a manufacturing role, but the skills that are required might be same. So that shift in the mindset has to be driven within the organization. And third, I would say, we all have career paths, right, identified in our organizations. That has to move from just role-based to skill hierarchy-based, right? So we need to identify skills, you know, which are outward looking. We should be able to have um, identified future skills for the organization. We should be able to benchmark the skills that are required, which are emerging, which are declining skills. And I think over here, the technology really helps because this cannot be done manually. So benchmarking skills within the industry, I think that is of prime importance. What will be the emerging skills? What will be the declining skills? So I think these are the factors. These are the challenges that we face as an organization. I'm sure you know other organizations also face. And we are trying to step it up. We want to have an intelligence layer, skills intelligence layer, uh, you know, within our digital platform to ensure that skills are benchmarked externally. Very interesting, Rashmi. So on one hand, I think we heard from Mr. Srinivasan how the technical skills are becoming more complex. On the other hand, we also heard from um, uh, Rashmi how the adjacent skills are still equally important, right? So while technical is important, the adjacent are equally important. So Amit, if I may ask you, you know, for a, from a technology provider or, a, you know, in the space, uh, the skills space, I'm sure you interact with a lot of organizations. So, you know, what in your view is, are the challenges here? You know, what have you seen across different organizations that you've interacted with? Uh, so, so first of all, uh, let me put a disclaimer. Uh, whatever I'm talking is on the behalf of our customer, partner, ecosystem. Uh, so we ourselves don't face this problem. We get to know about this problem from our customers. Some of them are here. Uh, some of them may be in the crowd. So from our perspective, uh, first you need to understand, uh, like uh, around 30 years back, uh, company was your career, right? Around 20 years back, your work has become your career. At 10 years back, you become your career. Good work, good company, you can change and get a good career. But now, skill is becoming a career, right? So there is no more blue collar, there is no more white collar, it's a skill collar. Previously, a person used to be known by the degree he or she possesses, right? And he has a chance to earn that degree only once in a lifetime. But because that caller is changing from the degree to skill, the person has opportunities, ongoing opportunities forever. Acquire more skills, unlock the potential, right? So what we have seen from the skill point of view, every employee is looking at skill as their career now. So this is the first thing. <coughs> Now, you asked about the challenges, right, about the organization. So I would say there are three major challenges what organizations are facing. What we observed is, first is defining the skill taxonomy. Second is defining the skill ontology. And third one is the skill validation. What does that mean? So first of all, as a talent leader, as a BU head, as a business head, as the HR head, you need to define a skill taxonomy not for today, not for short or medium term, even for long term, right? You need to be aligned with the vision of your organization, the ecosystem changes. So defining skill taxonomy, a relevant skill taxonomy is be even becoming challenging because skills are become dynamic, it's a moving piece, right? Once that is done for the core functional skills, what an organization knows, you need to move away from the job description and work mentality to, uh, mentality to skill mentality. And comes the skill on ontology. And in skill ontology, men, uh, creating it and updating it every now and then, according to the job description, according to the moving work, is becoming very challenging to them. And once these two things are done, then uh, in that case, what Rashmi said, primary and secondary skills both becomes critical. Why? Because you may need to upskill and reskill, and there may be some set of population which are more prone to get uh, quickly upskill because of their secondary skills. Okay? And once these things are done, you need to validate those skills as the third challenge. When I say validation, first, have you grasped that skill theoretically? Second, are you able to apply that skill into application? Third, are you able to perform on the job with that skill? So uh, I would say skill taxonomy, skill ontology, and skill validation are the three major challenges according to us what companies are facing.
That's that's very helpful, Amit. So, um, Mr. Senthil, you know, as as the chief learning officer of Exaware, you were sort of the holder or the custodian of the skills and you know develop. So, how how do you deal with these challenges? So, you know, what in your recommendation? Where do organizations start with? Right, we're talking about embedding skills into everything, but you know, as an HR professional, where do I start? See, when we look back five, six years ago when we started off on the journey that we are presently in, we really sought out to first think, how do our customers really consume skills today? That was the origination. And one thing that we distinctly felt then was, it is no longer just one single skill, but really composite skills that customers and actually roles, therefore, really require today. That was the starting point. Now that automatically led us to start defining what those different roles are as we need in an organization. What are the skill combinations we need, a learning plan, a learning path, assessment. So the L&D cycle was sort of began there, the journey began. But that was only the beginning. There are many other things that over time that happened which probably we did not fully see then. Immediately that followed was our hiring. Even if a lateral hire that we were getting in wasn't exactly, wasn't 100% fit for with all the skills, but that is, became the framework under which we started learning with the belief that the gaps could be very easily filled in through upskilling, etc. So that, that made sure a new lateral hire that, who joined the organization was also aligned and was growing towards the same direction and vision we had in terms of skills in the organization. The other supporting uh, framework, whether it is our financial systems, HR, operational systems, gradually also started tracking, measuring, reporting, everything by this aggregated skills, which we call roles. Then we linked it back to, I mean, the, look at the employee side and looked at all these and excellence there as an additional attribute of measuring potential and then linked it back into the PMS. So this is how they all came together and enough impetus was put on the employee side too for adoption evangelization, which really put us on a good path where we are ready for the new world. Thank you so much, Senthil, sir. And I think it's pretty much how we would think about every transformation, right? There's a mindset change involved. There's embedding into different processes involved. There's a full-fledged change management involved. And I think the conversation, the point Rashmi mentioned, I think as any other transformation, you start with that mindset change, you know, that skill is going to be the governing factor for everything I do. So moving on, uh, I think one of the other challenges we heard was uh, just understanding what skills people have, you know, how do we measure the skills? How do we know what skill gaps are? It was easier in the past time, you know, when there was a correlation with, let's say, your pedigree and skills. That's no longer the case. So maybe Mr. Srinivasan, if you can tell us how, you know, how to approach this understanding skills and identifying skill gaps issue. So um, I think that's, 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 that's a very, um, you know, complicated issue and I'll be very frank about that, but there is a solution. So I'm not going to go into competency assessment and I think skill, skill taxonomies, I think uh, Amit has already uh, spoken about that. So I think <clears throat> the cookie cutter one size fits all approach really needs to be done away with, right? As, as we look at uh, the entire learning process, right? And I think uh, in smaller organization, learning typically happens on the job or people start working in technologies and learn while they're working so on and so forth. It's the organizations at scale which uh, would really face the issue of, you know, how do I democratize learning, but at the same time ensure that the impact is there. So um, I think the, the gaps exist because uh, we try to uh, broad brush uh, learning and training, right? And I think that, that definitely needs to be customized because first the question needs to be asked as to why the training needs to exist, right? Is it, is it a performance gap that we are filling? Is it a competency gap we are, that we are filling? Is it a multi-skilling or upskilling that one is trying to do? Or is it that we are trying to, there's already a great uh, skilled person who exists who wants to further skill himself 
using the organizational priorities in the, in the direction that the organization is going. Let's say, for example, uh, at a very small level, let's say a great Java, Java coder wants to become a Java architect, right? So that's, that's an, I mean, are, are, we, are we ready to really go and say that, hey, uh, you know, uh, we can support you and we can make sure that, you know, um, uh, you are fully supported in your endeavor to become a Java architect. So there are ma many companies which have cracked the code on that. But I think it's important for us that, you know, technology needs to, because I can't keep going around and finding people in each category saying, okay, how many people are there with performance gaps? How many people are there with competency gaps? It's going to become difficult. So technology will have to play a very, very important role. I know that most com companies' learning systems are technology enabled, but are they really enough, right? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. So in context of competency, performance, cross-skilling, and purely human endeavor or human intelligence, are we willing to look at uh, learning in these four dimensions and provide technological learning solutions accordingly? And to the extent that it is extensive and it, is, it has a you know, learning program, it has an assessment program, it, it has to be the whole nine yards, basically. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Srinivasan. That's that's very input. So uh, maybe Senthil, sir, anything, uh, Mr. Senthil, we talked about technology as chief learning officer. Any example you would like to share where you've used technology in your organization to uh, to either assess skills or you know run programs or assess skill gaps? Okay. As everybody said, technology is only an enabling function, but a very important enabling function. One part from that I would go to the broader talent supply chain itself is applying technology, for example, to measure where people are. The days are gone with the present scale and volume and velocity. You can't be individually doing that. That's one place where it, technology applies. The other is in talent acquisition itself, whether it is assessments, whether it is recruiter experience, whether it is candidate experience, plenty of new technologies are available today which didn't exist, exist before, which we apply to make sure that the whole talent supply chain is seamless, delivering volume, delivering velocity, and as we have learned in the COVID world, also helping us detect frauds and malpractices too. Thank you, thank you so much, Senthil. So one thing that um, uh, we talk a lot about skills and generally in the HR space is, is going beyond what we internally as an organization do. I think, Senthil, so you touched upon that. There are a lot of solutions available on employee experience, for example. So, um, so are we looking at a broader ecosystem, you know, startups, you know, government? How do they facilitate some of our skill agenda? So, Amit, I think you're closest in this space. So, how do we, you know, like leverage everything around us uh, uh, to move us towards a skill first organization? So, uh, as I said, and even Suji, the co-founder of IMOCA said earlier, so there are external factors also that can affect uh, skill uh, path, I would say, or skill roadmap of, for an organization. For example, I'll tell you an example. In India, government wanted to implement uh, clean energy, clean gasoline over a period of time. And there are two companies, automotive companies, one um, Tata, which took, uh, which is taking the EV ways, uh, electric vehicle ways, and the other company, uh, for example, Maruti, with the help of Toyota, uh, is taking uh, the way of uh, hybrid, right? They are trying to solve to the government mandate over a period of time. So government has decided their vision in India, right? And accordingly, those two companies have taken a stand. Now from now to there, and even moreover, like if uh, Tata goes Tesla way, they need to apply AI even over there, over a period of time. So in this case, the government decisions or the ecosystem decisions, right, decides the course of the action. So definitely it affects. Then at the same time, government appoints agencies and institutions like NASCOM in India doing a great job in terms of understanding skills, which location to invest, like whether Pune has IT services population data scientist or uh, Gurgaon has or Bangalore has. So institutions like NASCOMS is doing a great job there in understanding the skill movement in a country as a whole, right? And regardless of industry, like NASCOM is doing it for IT, the others are doing it for uh, other industries. And in Western world, so it is very well defined for almost every industry, okay? So that's one. 
Then second thing is, uh, apart from organization, if or organization would like to take a skill first approach, solve those problems in between, do upskilling, reskilling, which is a mandate. It's, it's not an optional now, right? Reskilling and upskilling. Your skill is changing faster than ever, and you cannot acquire it from the market all the time because they may be new, right? So when they are doing it, you need to take help of the EdTech HR, HR take a lot, be it LMS, be it LXP, be it ATS, be it a skill intelligence platform like iMocha, uh, be it uh, in, any uh, other stuff. And third, even uh, there are a lot of universities in India, there are few, but in Western world quite a few, who are looking at the trends where industries are going, different things are going, and, th uh, and uh, this is one part of it. And again, as I said uh, earlier, in defining skill taxonomies even, you need to take help of people advisories, uh, like Bain and Company, Gartner, and others. So beyond organization, there are advisories, there is government, there are institutions, there are edtech startups, there are HR tech, there are edtech. You need to take help from to do the, this transformation in totality. And still, vision has to be decided by your company, because if that goes wrong, <laughs> all this may, may go wrong. Very, very valid point, Amit. I think there's a lot of help available around. I think you mentioned ed tech companies. I think universities, academicians is one thing that we've probably not uh, used enough. The great source of, and uh, we in India have some of the best, uh, you know, talent available in that space as well. Uh, but the vision should be yours. That's, I think, a key underlying point. So uh, maybe, Rashmi, if you have an example where, you know, you've successfully used or been driven by, you know, uh, using one of these partnerships to upskill your people and you can share with the group? I think um, we have successfully taken um, industry academia partnership to a good level um, by Biocon Academy. So it is, I think, one of its kind, which does not only build talent for Biocon, but also for other pharma organizations. We have partnership and it is based on the framework from, um, you know, Sloan Kettering Institute. So we ensure that graduates that are fresh out of college have certain operating, um, you know, academia in terms of how to, you know, quality, manufacturing. These aspects are covered in that academy to ensure that they are operational from day one once they graduate out of that academy. These nuances are not, you know, in the universities. They are not taught in universities, right? So. I think that is a very successful platform for us, which helps us um, with respect to talent, not only for us, but other pharma organizations. Yeah. That's such an amazing example. I think industry academia, I think generally a, a lot of traction has been on that space. You know, Indian government is also, I think one of the recent things I read that I was very excited about was that um, if you want to be a professor now in an academic institution, uh, you don't need to have a PhD. You know, you, if you have a, a corporate experience, you could still go and become a professor. Again, you know, one of the uh, intent being to promote the industry academy are learning. So a great conversation, maybe uh, Dr. Jay Kumar, I'll come back to you. I asked you the first question on, you know, where we are, what do we understand by skill first? So maybe, you know, uh, closing, what vision should we all set ourselves up for? You know, what should we, uh, you know, what is a North Star? You know, where should we headed as far as being a skill first organization or being a skill first country for that matter? Thank you. Now I can summarize whatever they have told. It's an easy thing to do. First and foremost is the mindset or the culture part of it. Hierarchy versus role. Okay, I am at this level, this level, this level if it goes. Whereas the total shift is on the role and what skill set is required to attain that. So the flatter organizations are more linked. Then our friend very nicely told, talked about skill taxonomy. It's, it looks, he's told it very easily and simple, but it's a very, very Herculean task. Imagine a company like l 80 year old organization, 52,000 employees, if different businesses were first identifying the skill taxonomy, then the proficiency level. Then putting these people in those proficiency level, how do I measure them, how do I put them? If I ask them to self-rate, everybody will sell one rep of eight scale, he's eight, you'll tell nine and ten. Then his immediate superior has to measure. And then I have to, from there I have to use it for my future requirements, right? It's, it's a, 
yes there are certain systems platforms available but when you really get into that you find a lot of difficulty in implementation but that is not an excuse we have to ensure we identify the skill per start training them on focusing that on those skills etc um so my feeling is we focus on two things one is how do you bring in that learning agility and digital mindset so the person should have the eagerness to learn new things how the an organization you will facilitate with those things by way of hybrid learning or an um, online learning or a gamified learning or bringing in some points bringing certain and encouragement of people to learn a particular skill and effectively utilize that in 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 those areas and i really like the industry academia interface so that we even go to the third year and second year itself we have an edutech where we talk about which are the skills required we we, uh, we interact with the colleges and then try to develop those skills required for our, our ourselves so it is not the survival of the fittest it is the survival of the fastest who try to identify the skill and train them and get on board them into the organization thank you very much so maybe survival of the skillest is what we will close our discussion with thank you so much esteemed panelists great to have you thank you so much for giving us time i found this very insightful i hope our audience found it as well thank you so much